Well, today is an awesome day by all means on Nats Classic. And it's a big one for me because uh, we have two, two actors that I definitely grew up with and I uh, think the world of. So uh, first of all, I, what can I say? I've got uh, Bill Mumy and Angela Cartwright from Lost in Space on today. And it doesn't get any better than that, folks. So yes, I know I am a lucky guy. So um, we will be talking today about their, uh, their careers as well as their new, well, their time on Lost in Space, as well as their new book that they've just both come out and uh, put out together. So uh, why don't we start? First of all, uh, thank you for being here, Angela. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> and thank you for being here, Bill. Hi, John. It's good to be here. It's just Moomy, though. It's not really a Mew. Like the, the, cat, <laughs> the, cat, the cat part doesn't really work, but the Moo, the moo is right. It's got to be that Wisconsin uh, background that I have where it comes out Moomy. Oh, my gosh. I, I've heard it wrong more than I've heard it right. But I got know. you. Well, my apologies, but uh, no but uh, I love it. Um, so why don't uh, why don't we start out? I'd like to uh, I kind of go between the both of you. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit about like your early career. I know a lot of the uh, the fans, you know, I, they're they're so familiar with both of your backgrounds before Lost in Space ever came into the picture. Um, Bill, what what was it like for you? I mean, you literally, I feel like when when I was a kid, you were on every show that I watched. I mean, literally. And um, so what was it like when you started out? Because I, I mean, I've seen you going all the way back to uh, Dear Bridget, even with, uh, what was that, Jimmy Stewart and uh, Bridget Bardot? Oh, yeah. But there was many years before Dear Bridget, you know, Twilight Zones and Hitchcocks and Disney movies. And um, I, I was very lucky to have a uh, uh, eclectic and prolific early career you know I worked a lot and one week I'd be on a sitcom the next week I'd be on a drama or a cop show or a medical show or a sci-fi show and or I'd go do a movie for a few months so I really cut my teeth uh, working with some of the true masters of the industry and uh, that was a good experience did you when you when you refer to that are, are you referring to like Alfred Hitchcock people like that that uh, you worked with or who who would you say who would you say had some of the greatest influence? I mean, I know you worked with Jack Klugman on that Pip episode of Twilight Zone, and uh, Cloris Leachman I think was on the other one. A lot of, lot of worked, incredible actors. Cloris was a big influence because I worked with her four times. Um, it's like if if a musician jams with another musician and that musician happens to teach you some new licks or riffs, uh, you can't help but maybe pick that up and whether I was working with Walt Disney or Alfred Hitchcock or Lucille Ball or Jack Benny or Red Skelton or Jimmy Stewart or Shirley Jones. I mean, there's a, you know, I mean, I don't want to just go through a list of no, people. It's okay. Like it. It's okay. I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's cool because you, you were in so many things. Did you, you know, a lot of people that I've had on the show, sometimes they were like, I was so young. I didn't really realize at the time who I was, you know, working with. Did you have that, that sense as a, as a younger actor to go, wow, this is, you know, Jimmy Stewart, or I'm working with David Jansen right now. I mean, did you did you have that sense of that? No, not really. I had that sense when I worked with Walt Disney because I was I watched the Mickey Mouse Club and I went to Disneyland. I had that sense when I worked with Lucy because she was so iconic and you'd seen her every day on you know on reruns. But if I was working with Claude Rains or you know that type of great classic actor uh you know my mother might say oh my god you're working with claude rains for the next six days but it wasn't like i had seen casablanca or the invisible man i was seven years old you know so right. i wasn't i was never really aware of the catalogs of these great golden age stars that i worked with until later in life well so that, i was well yeah so i wasn't really intimidated by them you know the only, like I said, Disney, Walt Disney made me nervous because he was Walt Disney. Uh, everybody else didn't really, I didn't quake in my boots with, uh, and everybody was pretty nice. And Angela's had, you know, the same experiences working with tons of iconic stars. Yeah, I, you know, I, I same thing. I was, I was researching your background, Angela, and I saw that uh, you had worked early, really early on. I think it was with uh, Rock Hudson. I, I believe it was, and, and were were you like too young to even like take that in, or well, yeah, yes, <laughs> he was only yeah. three. 
<laughs> right. And uh, Rock Hudson and Sidney Poitier. Yes. Um, Something of Values, the name of that movie. Mm -hmm. um, my first job, my first movie was um, Somebody Up There Likes Me with Paul Newman. At the oh, time, right. I didn't realize that this was Paul Newman. But later years, I certainly did and thought, God, I was really lucky to sit on Paul Newman's lap. Yeah, no. But uh, that was later. <laughs> I mean, when you're three, you know, I can remember certain things. But um, yeah, it's kind of, it, it's, you know, at that age, you don't know somebody's career. And what, what about working with, uh, obviously, you were on the Danny Thomas show for all those years. Um, what was that like working with Danny Thomas? At that point, were you able to kind of, you know, take that in how big this show was at the time? You know, I, at, when I was very young, I started when I was four on the Danny Thomas show. It went for seven years. Um, we did the show live in front of a, a live audience every Thursday. Um, I don't think I ever sat and thought, God, this is a really popular show. It was, mm -hmm. you know, when you start something that young, it just becomes your life. And, you know, I don't think I sat and, and thought that not everybody goes to work um, on a television show. But when you start that young, it's like going to preschool. Wow. This is, just becomes your life. And I worked with uh, I worked with so many of the greats that were in Danny Thomas's um, you know, circle at mm -hmm. that time and don't really didn't really realize it until later in life how interesting did and, and danny thomas i understand you had a close relationship with him is that true well i call him daddy number two i mean he was a wow. great influence because he was everything my dad was not you know he was loud he was gregarious he was you know very funny um you know he sat at the piano and would sing and um you know, and I worked with him when I wasn't working, I was at home. So uh, he was, he was always great to me. Uh, and I always enjoyed learning his comedic skills. Um, it was like being, you know, in a workshop every week, because you were in front of a live audience, you had to wait for the laughs and stuff like that. Yeah, so that was a great experience for me. Did he, now, am I right on this? Because I, I mean, obviously everybody knows you from Sound of Music by all means. What did, is it right? Did he release you to, to do Sound of Music or what, what was that all about? He did. We knew that the show was coming to an end, but he actually released me from the last show so that I could start the Sound of Music. And he didn't have to do that. And I'm forever grateful, of course. You know, it's something like that sometimes can uh, you know, if the studio is not willing to work with you, they'll just go cast somebody else. But he right. did release me from that last show um, and so that I could start, you know, Sound of Music. Thank gosh. You know, that was a year's work. So I'm glad that happened. You shot that for a year? I didn't realize yeah. that. Those were the days of the uh, big movies where you rehearsed and you had months of rehearsal so that when we ended up going to Austria, um, we knew everything that we were supposed to do, all the choreography, all the singing, we had, you know, um, lots and lots of rehearsal. So it was really just the rain that kept us there. I got <laughs> it you. did rain quite a bit. And wow. uh, that did make the schedule go longer in Austria than it was supposed to. And were you as, I mean, another thing that I read is that you're, you and the cast were extremely close. I mean, and I'm talking about the kids. I, I think Christopher Plummer might be in his own vein yeah. there, but I mean, the kids. Yeah. Yeah, we were. We were, um, you know, both Lost in Space and Sound of Music have been that kind of experience for me, where it's you become very close and you stay in touch. I mean, Bill and I, um, you know, we we have stayed friends uh, all these years. And, you know, seeing Marta or Mark, um, it's it's like a family. And the same with with the Sound of Music kids. They're all over the world, but we just get together and it's like we're picking up where we left off we're just like one big dysfunctional family <laughs> wow I think that's pretty cool Bill Bill were you um you know the one the one character I guess or the one actor I should say out of Lost in Space that I have not seen quite that connection with when I'm doing I've done research on it is Guy Williams because I know that he had you know he had a tight tie-in obviously with Zorro did did you um did you continue on to have a friendship with him uh, no, I, I loved Guy and watching Zorro as a little kid. Yeah, was the uh, 
really the catalyst watching Zorro and watching Superman, George Reeves as Superman. Mm -hmm. Those two characters were really, really the catalyst for me to become very passionate about wanting to get inside the television. Wow. I wanted to be like those adventurers. And of course, when Will Robinson on Lost in Space, that character became something that I got to do. Uh, it was it was exactly what I'd always been driven to do, which was be a little superhero. Wow! And uh, and Guy was was wonderful, as Angela will tell you. He's he was incredibly intelligent. He was uh, really into uh, classic music and chess and reading. And he uh, he was a wonderful guy. I, I learned how to fence by Zorro in a spacesuit, you know, which was great. Wow. But <laughs> but uh, when when the show ended. It ended quite unexpectedly because we had done 83 episodes and we had wrapped for a hiatus <clears throat> and we were all told we'd be coming back. So there was no, you know, final wrap party or any kind of, well, goodbye, this has been great. Wow. We just went, up, we just went on, on our vacation for a couple of months thinking we'd be back at it in 10 weeks or something. And... Uh, that obviously didn't prove to be true. So we never really had a proper, this was great, see you around. Uh, and then Guy moved to Argentina very right. soon after, after the series ended. And uh, he kind of returned to his uh, celebrity status as Zorro. And he uh, stayed in Argentina. And unfortunately, uh, because of a brain aneurysm, he passed away at 65. I never saw Guy again. Angela saw him because they came in 1983. Uh, guy came back into Hollywood to do a celebrity episode of um, what was that? Uh, Family Feud. Family Feud. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that I, was the last I, time I saw Guy. And what uh, was that like to see at that point when it had been that that much time had passed? Um, it was it was nice to see everybody. June was on that also. Um, Marta and and Bob May, mm -hmm. uh, who was the man in the robot. The robot, um, right. That was a fun thing. It was for charity. We did. We were up against Batman and Gilligan's Island. We did pretty good. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that was that was a fun thing. Um, I don't ever think I remember. I I went. Oh, and this is going to be the last time I see Guy. You know, you don't think like that. No. That's why you make the most of. You know, whenever you see somebody, you never know. Um, right. Right. Make the most of it. You, you mentioned uh, um, Bob May. Uh, what was, you know, obviously the two of you were around, around him being in the robot uh, suit all the time. Was, was it like short moments? Like, you know, where he'd be in there and they'd be like, okay, we got to, you know, get him out. And, you know. Or was oh, hell it... no. No? Hell no. What? He loved, he, he loved being in that prop. He loved being in that claustrophobic, dangerous little prop. Do you know that's crazy? <laughs> If you'd left it up to him, he would have been in there eight or nine hours straight. He loved being in there. He, Bobby was um, over the top enthusiastic. He was, uh, I'll, I'll just say that's, a, that's an accurate description. He was over the top enthusiastic. He had he was a really- so happy being the robot. And so he uh, would stay in there. He would actually just be in there while, and eat his lunch in there. He'd smoke cigarettes in there. <laughs> um, he was Sorry. just really uh, committed to being the robot. Um, wow. He loved his job. I must say that. He was a very happy camper with that robot suit and always was very proud to be a part of the show. I never had, expected you to say that. Wow. He had a, re he had a really hard job because uh, he, he had to memorize all of the robot's dialogue, uh, deliver it with comedic timing. Uh, and as he spoke each syllable, he had a, uh, a clicker, like a teletype thing in, yeah. the le in the left claw. And he would do that. That does not compute, right? He would click that to each syllable and then it would illuminate the, uh, the neon on the, the front chest plate of the of the robot. But, uh, it, you know, when you're standing there on the set and you're in a scene and with Jonathan and I or whatever, uh, it just sounded like a guy inside a fiberglass wooden, <laughs> you know, prop yelling wow. at you. And, uh, and Bobby's tonality, as I said, was very uh, enthusiastic and, and, and loud. So, you know, he would sound like, Hey, Dr. Smith, it's good to see you. 
<laughs> true. It's totally yeah. true. That that actually, I had a moment of like, oh my God, Bob's here. Uh, yeah, he, he so, uh, up. so his uh, the robot's dialogue was then re-recorded by the great voice actor Dick Tufeld. Um, but Bobby had a, a very hard job because it, it was actually Bobby who brought character and certain familiar quirks to that prop. He would draw his arms in mm -hmm. and, and lock the claws in place. And yeah, then he could, yeah. spin the, he could spin the torso around almost like a Linda Blair type thing. Wow. <laughs> he did the waving of the arms. He did the head comes up and down and he could spin the head all around. He worked extremely hard. Um, he and was it, it was hot out. in there. It was very hot in, inside that thing because he had no no air or anything. But then they'd you know sometimes take the bottom part off so he would mm -hmm. walk if it wasn't in the shot that the feet were going to be showing, or they would you know disconnect the top part and he'd be in there with his black mask on so that you wouldn't see his eyes through the. Well, it was uh, it was make it, it was makeup. He had this black kind of vaudevillian. Uh, uh, makeup like a raccoon mask so no no flesh tones would be seen through the the, the rectangular little oh, that's uh, wild prisms yeah. he, he, he went to the bank one day at lunch without you know washing off the makeup and he almost <laughs> he almost got arrested there's lots of lots of stories about Bobby <laughs> good and timing and the rest and the rest of the lost in space cast and beyond that are actually true uh, in our book, Lost and Found in Space, Blast Off into the Extended Edition. And where can you get the book, by the way? Well, you can get the book at uh, AngelaCartwrightStudio.com. We have signed editions of the book. Both Bill and I have signed them and uh, personalized them, if you wish. Mm -hmm. um, or you can get them on Amazon or other places. But I must say the quality of the book that we sell with our signatures is uh, really nice. And there's a little few little extras that are in with that when they're shipped off. So AngelaCartwrightStudio.com. You can go to the bookshelf. I think it's right on the front page, actually. And you can mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. click on that. Well, believe me, um, people are going to be asking. So I'm glad that yeah, we got you, that in there. Right? If you just, yeah, if you just want an easy thing, you can get it without the signatures at Amazon. Okay. Yeah. Um, talking about uh, that, by the way, the other, obviously, you know, all those movements of the robot you mentioned are like iconic with Lost in Space fans. I, I knew right away, I'm like, oh my God, I totally know what you're talking about. I felt that too with Jonathan Harris, all of his, you know, uh, I don't know, this one hits me, a cackling cacophony, I think is what how he put it or something like that. He had all these like phrases that I understood he actually created. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Indeed, he did, dear boy, and don't you forget it. Mind your manners or you'll lose your friends. <laughs> Babbling bumps. Uh, 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 you cantankerous clump. Right. Uh, uh, Jonathan we have a list invented, of those in the book, too. Yes, <laughs> we do. better ones. Oh, that's yes, a good one. Yes, they are. Yes, it's true. Uh, Jonathan uh, wrote all of the uh, insults, the illiterate insults to the robot, but he also uh, basically from the very beginning or almost the very, very beginning. Uh, he was given free reign to rewrite Smith's dialogue. Really? So, absolutely, 100%. Um, so Jonathan Colored was largely, he was largely responsible for uh, shifting the tone of the Smith character from a nefarious murdering saboteur to a character that was a selfish weasel that you love to hate. Yeah. Did you guys have trouble at times on the set, like just keeping it together with him? Like, would you bust a gut or what was that like? I mean, being with somebody like that. I love Jonathan. We, we both love Jonathan. Um, uh, but in any series over the course of a full, we worked together 10 months a year for three years. Wow, you know, 10 I mean, months. Today's today's concept of making a television series is maybe six or ten episodes. Well, we did thirty. You know, I mean, wow. we worked together Monday through Friday, like I said, ten months a year. Angela and I were the only people we went to school with for four years. Wow. Um, uh, so, it, to answer your question, during that time period, there were a couple of times where we cracked up. You know, where you, it just happens for some reason. Oh, it yeah. becomes a, 
a contagious wave that uh, washes over the, the group of actors. And once you kind of caught that bug, it's very hard to, to not yeah. let, it, let it wear out its course. So certainly there were a few times where we just cracked up and couldn't, couldn't stop laughing for a while. But basically, uh, we got things done very quickly and professionally. And Jonathan was fantastic to work with, always prepared and always wonderful and warm and friendly and giving. Did he have any resentment at all um, from the standpoint of, you know, they always had a uh, special guest star, Jonathan Harris. Did he take that? Was there ever any point where it was like, you know, because he was obviously was a huge part of the show. I mean, when people <laughs> ask about it, that's one of the first things that comes up. He probably he ever... cheered it because I think yeah. his his part was only supposed to be for a couple episodes. Mm -hmm. um, and he actually worked it into this long running part. So in a way it kind of, I, I think he kind of celebrated that, um, you know, there was no way they were going to change the, the credits, you know, with June and Guy being first, um, you know, in their contract. So I'm not sure. I, I don't think it ever bothered him. Do you, Bill? Well, he was very, very proud of creating that. Um, you see the character of Dr. Smith and the character of the robot, we're not in the original pilot. Right. Uh, they, they were not uh, planned uh, to be in the series. That was actually a network afterthought note that was a, a rare, very brilliant network. Afterthought. Exactly. I was just going to say that. No, yes. Because it's rare. You know, networks tend to want to fiddle with everything. And they, exactly. They, they water things down or they too many, you know, ingredients in the pie. Really very food. common. Yes. But the idea of adding a robot and the idea of adding a, a saboteur that was stuck along with them, excellent ideas. But everyone else, you know, Guy, June, Marta, Mark, Angela, and myself, all of our contracts and deals were in place from the pilot. So our billing was, 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 was locked in its positions. So Jonathan, when offered the, the, the series, he said, uh, I know, I shall be special surprise, special guest star. And Irwin Allen said, forget about it. That's never been happened before. You can't be a special guest star wow. every week. And Jonathan said, oh, indeed I can. And indeed I will. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> and, and he yeah. did. So, so he created that and he was very proud of that. Wow. Now, did you, now here's another one too. Obviously the first season has its own tone. The second season has a very different tone. And you're obviously in color at that point. Did you, both of you, did you feel that as, as actors? Like, whoa, there's a real shift to this show taking place right here. Did you feel that, Angela? Yeah, definitely. There was a shift. I think the second season, uh, you know, because it was in color, it was very um, Peter Max-ish, mm -hmm. uh, bright costumes. Um, that had not really been on the air anywhere. Um, something that was so bright and whoa, this is color. Um, so I think we felt that shift. And then it felt a lot more comedic, you know, with Jonathan's additions. Um, the first season was very, very serious. I think it had more, um, you know, Star Trek came later, but it had more of that seriousness about it. But you, the times that it came out was during the time of we had not walked on the moon space was wow. the final frontier that it grabbed people's imaginations so um i think it, it, it we did know there was a shift in the second season definitely but you know what i i mean we were just kids and we had so much fun working on that show um that you know we we were okay with it i think wow yeah. well Here's the here's here's the, the deal. The show aired in the family hour from 7:30 to 8:30. And if you watch the first 15 or 16 episodes of Lost in Space mm -hmm. in black and white with John Williams' brilliant scores, uh, it's and the, all right. and the scripts that uh, that we the themes that we were producing, they're dark. They're scary. Mm -hmm. The net the network started to get a lot of mail from parents saying, this show is scaring our kids. So two things happened. One, the network mandated that the show change its tone to a lighter tone because it was getting too scary, wow. which is what Erwin Allen had envisioned. He had envisioned right. a serious 
show about you know this pioneer family against alien elements and anything that happened and it was it was scary <clears throat> and that's what he had wanted to continue with but you know he, he was a great businessman and the the, the uh, network mandated that the tone lighten up and jonathan at the same time mm -hmm. realizing that the character of smith as created would have been pushed out of the airlock or taken away <clears throat> within a handful of episodes because yeah. He was trying to kill kids. Right. 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 So he, he, he manipulated that character into more of what it became. And really by the second half of the first season, still in black and white, but by the second half of the first season, after Batman had come on, mm -hmm. you have to also remember, this is, this is 1965 through 1968. This is the pop art period. Oh, yeah. I mean, when we came on the air, the Beatles were singing uh, I Feel Fine. Wow. When we, were, when we were going off the air, the Beatles had recorded uh, Revolution Number 9. Wow. Right? I mean, there was a global cultural pop art shift that was changing so fast, fashion-wise, politically. The Vietnam War was, you know, raging and people were protesting it all over. The hippie movement was, it was being birthed. Wow, and, you're right uh, in the middle of it. Wow. We, we, we were right indeed in the middle of it. And so the cha those changes, you can just, they reflect the time period very well. And um, when we went to color, uh, Irwin's assistant, Paul Zasput Navitz, who was the designer of uh, a lot of the sets and all of the wardrobe, he just went wild. He went psychedelic, you know? And uh, the wardrobe from the show looks fantastic. Uh, Angela, Marta, and I, were at uh, Heritage Auctions a couple of months ago where many, many of the original Lost in Space wardrobes uh, were being auctioned off. I saw the photos. Auction. Yeah, I yeah. saw those photos with you guys. Yeah, well, my third season purple velour yellow turtle dicky and ski pants sold for $93,000. Oh, whoa! <laughs> yeah, uh, so, so those are iconic 60s looks that uh, we probably they were in excellent were. condition though but at the outfits we were really impressed wow we, we felt so younger cool. actually looking at them because they didn't look as old as we, <laughs> we <laughs> 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 uh, age better than us <laughs> that is really something wow that really is did you um uh did you, at the time, you know, the, the pilot, the pilot comes out and it, I understand that it was the most expensive pilot that had been made at that point. I mean, I, I, I don't know if I'm right, right on this, but I, I heard 600,000, which is a lot of money now. And it's a lot of money then, you know, a lot more money then. What uh, did you realize that at the time? Were you like, wow, this looks pretty amazing? Well, it was the most expensive pilot, but it was also in many ways, the most ambitious pilot. I mean, Irwin Ir Allen was a guy who wanted everything big, you know, uh, and he wasn't afraid to spend money on his vision. Hmm. The, Jup the Jupiter 2 is a wonderful set and prop. The robot is fantastic. Designed real by size. Bob yeah, the real the robot is, uh, you know, was designed by Bob Kenoshita, who also designed Robbie the Robot. From oh, yeah, right, right, exactly. I heard the computers the, were real, too, that you, you had. Those computers were, like, yeah. from that time were real. Like Burroughs or something like that? Is that true? They, 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 they didn't work, they had, but they, had, they lit up. They had light bulbs that would flash around. Okay. But my point being, the chariot, the robot, the, the, the ship, the mm -hmm. interiors and exteriors of the ship, the wardrobe, um, Irwin spent, spared no expense to, to present his vision in a very impressive way. Now, as the show became successful and as the show continued to air, then Irwin's attitude was more like, okay, now we can save money. We've established how good everything looks. So next time we have an alien, you know, come on, just use the same guy we used on Voyage to the Bottom of the right, Sea last right. week, only spray him green instead of orange. <laughs> That's that, and that happened definitely, um, but he, you know, this was before CGI, so you have to put it all in perspective when you talk about it. Mm -hmm. So it was very adventurous. The scenes outside, you know, um, the floating scenes, you know, we were on wires. 
you know, they do it differently now. It's come a long way. Of course, you know, it's many, many years ago, but um, it's, it, it still was a great example of imagination and bringing that to light, you know, and he went on to do these big, huge, you know, movies, Poseidon Adventure, or I'm talking about Irwin, um, you know, Towering Inferno. He it was always Irwin up, Allen's. Yeah, yeah, a really yeah. big, you know, cast of recognizable names and, you know, then disaster. But, um, you know, at the time, I think it was very advantageous and is that a word? And um, very, is. you know, insightful. He was very visionary about what he wanted it to look like. What about well, also? Uh, oh, go ahead, Bill, please. Uh, well, I, I think it's interesting to point out that although we were very well treated and our welfare worker, Francis Clamped, kept a good eye on, on, on safety things, the things that we did <laughs> in those days on that show, there's no way. No. They would let that be done today. I mean, I can't tell you how many explosions there were within two feet of us oh, every couple of every couple of days. All the smoke that was blown in, and the explosions, and the sparks, and the flames, and the fog. Irwin used to call it lurching, and he had a uh, he had like a, a hammer and a pail, and he would hit the hammer with the pail and. <gasps> The, and then we'd the, go there. Right. The cameraman would turn the camera. <laughs> yeah, because the there was light. always this kind of this thing going on, I know, in a lot of the episodes. <sighs> yeah, it, it was lurch. And the cameraman would turn the camera to the right, and we would all lurch to the left, and it would be this big dramatic thing. But, the, but seriously, uh, between the explosions that we were very close to constantly, and, wow. and also think about this, because obviously it, it just there's no way it could happen now. Angelo was often holding a chimpanzee with a helmet on its head, and they called the Bloop, right? Debbie the Bloop. Yeah. Well, sure, Debbie the Bloop was a trained chimpanzee, et cetera, et cetera. But when you are holding a chimpanzee, and the chimpanzee does not know that the panel six inches away from oh. it is going to explode in the next, while well, the lights are on, and all of a sudden, you can't explain. Hey, Debbie, after after he says action and Angela says this, this panel is going to explode. There's going to be sparks and fire. Oh, and my smoke gosh. And, right. Now, there was never there was never a, 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 an accident, a terrible accident. But think about what was it? Eight or 10 years ago when some monkey ate somebody's face. That, that is correct. Like, yes. Right. There's no way today they would let a 12 year old girl hold a chimpanzee and then blast explosions all around it. It's, we're so lucky that, that Debbie uh, never freaked out and, and started to hurt people. Oh, yeah, she could have because they, you know, they're cute and they're nice. And she loved Angela and she loved me. But, uh, you know, a chimp is, is, is a real strong animal. It is no an doubt animal about it. still her yes. powerful arms. And I, I remember the feeling of her. Um, yeah, and that's true. And, you know, more stories about <laughs> Debbie the Bloop in our book, Lost and Found in Space. Yeah, not to, not to pitch it directly, but there it is. No <laughs> kidding. Hey, um, one other thing, too, is Guy and Mark, I understand, they actually, they weren't as thrilled about the shift in the show going into, like, the, more the humorous aspect. They wanted more of a serious sci-fi. Is that true? Guy was hired to, to be the star of an adventure series set into the future in space. He was hired to be the equivalent of a modern day family Zorro, mm. right? Yeah. I mean, John Robinson was a superhero leading his family and the unknown. That's why Guy was cast in the show. Uh, when Jonathan came onto the show and started to become the star of the show and then the show shifted dramatically in tone and Guy's uh, participation in the scripts was greatly reduced. Mm -hmm. Of course he was unhappy. Yeah. But on the other hand, and we were there, okay? So of course you were. there's more, more on this on the book. Of course he was unhappy. But on the other hand, he was also happy to only have to go to work three days a week instead of five days a week and get the same paycheck. He was, he was fine being in his dressing room, listening to music, hanging out with June, and uh, relaxing, and then coming in and having to, to deliver three or four lives. It's the same paycheck for him. 
Wow. He, he, right? Okay. So yeah. if you're a doc, if you're um, whatever, that's just the way it was. He got paid by the episode and um, he, he was pretty cool about it. There was never any bad vibes on the set. Certainly business managers and agents were called and things were, were worked out and, and egos were appeased a bit. But um, Guy never uh, really bitched about the fact that, you know, he could work less and make the same amount of money. Mark was, um, Mark had done three series in a row back to back before Lost in Space and his peers were people uh, like Steve McQueen. Wow, I did not know that. Yeah, he came from a, a serious, you know, acting world and he saw himself in that, McQueen was a good friend of his, he saw himself in that mold. And uh, he thought from the very beginning, he was only 29 when he was cast in Lost in Space. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, he thought from the very beginning, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know if I feel good about this. I, uh, this, this might be a career buster. But, um, but he was the funniest, oh, God. wittiest, funniest. I can't tell you how much everybody loves Mark and everybody loved Mark. And I became like, you know, Robin to his Batman. And he and I did a lot of pranks and stuff and, and created a lot of trouble that you can read about. <laughs> well, give us an example of one of the pranks you did with him. Hell no. Oh, uh, come hell on. No. no, buy the book, baby. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Hey, as a side note, by the way, because I happen to be a big fan of this film, always was Papillon. I got to be honest with you, Bill. I was blown away when I saw that you were in Papillon. I I I I went back and and, and watched it. I'm like, B Bill is in there. I mean, it was it was pretty cool. What what uh, did you meet Steve McQueen? I, I lived with Steve and Dustin and Don Gordon for you know ten weeks, eleven weeks. Wow. It's uh, it's uh, I got very dramatic Papillon stories. Can you tell us a, one with Steve McQueen? No. <laughs> oh come on! Well, it's just, how, how's this? What was he like? How's that? Out. What was he like? What was Steve like? Steve was uh, he he had he had no star affectations in terms of hanging out with the crew or you know being treated differently than anybody else. He uh, he was a very 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 volatile guy. Hmm. He uh, he was with Ally McGraw on a John and Yoko reality, meaning that she was pretty much tattooed to him all the time. Wow. And he was, uh, <clears throat> he, he was a good actor um, and he was, uh, he was intense. I'll use the word intense and uh, he could be violent. And, uh, and I am writing my own autobiography, and there will be a lot to say about that. Hey, nice. Nice to know. I will buy that book, without a doubt. I want to know that one. Yeah. And buy this that. one first. <laughs> <laughs> and that book as well. Hey, um, so I understand that you tried to reboot the series, and and Irwin Allen would not let that let that go forward is that is that what went down or is there more to that well, well there's a lot more to that but let's just say uh it took 35 years to make that happen uh in 1980 which was uh what 12 years after the series had been off the air mm -hmm. everybody was doing uh, you know these movies of the week um classic shows mm -hmm. whether it was gilligan's island or don't be gillis or uh, whatever there was a lot of yeah that those type of projects going on so along with uh two of my creative partners paul gordon and brian greer we spent a long time writing a lost in space uh epilogue wow for a, for a movie of the week and uh, it was more in tone with the original uh, few episodes of the series and uh i I contacted all of the cast members. Uh, I did not speak to Guy, but I contacted all of the cast members, got mm -hmm. their feelings about it, got their notes about what they would like to see, what they wouldn't like to see. Okay. And then I called and I called Andy Siegel, who was head of development at CBS. And Andy Siegel had started his career as a second assistant director on Lost in Space. Wow. And now Andy was in the position to green light projects. And I called Andy 
and I sent him the script and I told him how I envisioned this. And Andy uh, was extremely enthusiastic about it and said, hell yeah, let's do this, which was great. But, and this is all my fault, okay? So looking back on this, yeah. this, is all, this is all on Bill and I, I accept this wholeheartedly. I did all of that before I contacted Erwin. Well, Lost in Space was Erwin Allen's. It was his, it wasn't mine. It sure. wasn't Andy Siegel's, it wasn't, I mean, in a way it was CBS's, but it was, it was Irwin's. Irwin got very pissed off in a way. I mean, he yeah. didn't throw a fit, but he made it clear to me, last time I ever spoke to him, he made it clear to me that if he ever wanted to return to law, that he was busy making feature films. Wow. And that if he, if he ever wanted to return to Lost in Space, it would be when he wanted to do it with the ideas that he wanted to see in it. And that if he wanted me to be in it, he would call my agent. And wow. he, made it, he made it very clear and very professional. And he was right that he would not read my script because there were only a handful of directions that a castaway story could be resolved in. And should he have any, should he, choose to do it in the future and lose any of those things uh he wouldn't want to be open himself to liable for me saying you ripped me off wow. and i i assured him that that was not my intent and he assured me that he was clear exactly as to what he would or would not do and wow. 35 35 years later that script was produced with the original cast, the surviving members of the original cast on eight cameras and is included on the Lost in Space Blu-ray. Oh so my gosh, did I didn't know that. That's so cool. Well, John, there's so much you, you need to learn. I need to get the book. And you need to Darwin get the is turning the over in his grave. Oh you, my you gosh. Need, you need to get the book and the Blu-ray because it's but, there, it's a bonus feature and it's uh, it's won some you know silly awards, but uh, it took a long time, but we did it. Oh my gosh, I'm I'm getting it for for real. What, um, Angela? For you, uh, I and I understand this happened with Bill as well. You both are in the the new series. You both had a part in the new series. Angela, what was that like? What was it like to suddenly you're on the set of Lost in Space and and it's like wow, <laughs> you know, you were well, the original. Cold. Member. <laughs> it was very cold. It was up in Canada. Um, the cool thing about it, because I wasn't really on, the, I mean, I went to the set, the Lost in Space set, but I wasn't really on the set because I was cast as the mother of, with Sheila, the name Sheila Harris, which I, I loved. Sheila was Irwin's wife's name. Oh, wow. And Harris, of course, was a, a nod to Jonathan. Um, I was the mother of Parker Posey, who took yes. the uh, namesake of, John, of Dr. Smith and Selma Ward, who was her sister. Mm -hmm. So it was really cool, I think. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, you know, I, I flew to, to Canada and um, my scenes took place on a boat and in an old house. And it was, it was just really fun. Um, you know, I enjoyed it and I loved doing the the nod to the fans of the show who have been so incredibly devoted to us and our our endeavors and we are so appreciative of that and I have always loved doing you know a little cameo a little nod I knew they would enjoy it that oh, was all the, uh you know Kevin Burns who was really our advocate without him I'm not sure where Lost in Space would have been uh, sadly, he passed away two years ago, but he was uh, brilliant and he was, you know, the creator of Ancient Aliens and he, um, on the you know, History Street. Channel yeah. things and he went on to do many, many shows, but he really loved Lost in Space and he loved all of us deeply uh -huh. and he was, um, you know, he collected all the original stuff. He you know, purchased all the pictures from the archives. He oh had, you know, the biggest collection of Lost in Space stuff. So he was behind this book 100% and gave us the nod. 
you know, when you pull off something like this, there's so many different angles and things that are involved. Mm -hmm. And it can take years for something to come together like this. And it just has to be the right timing. I, you know, I experienced that with the Sound of Music family scrapbook, which I had been the, you know, advocate for and had to, to work on getting the pictures and the, the memories of everybody and kind of congelling it all together. This was kind of the same thing, except Bill and I, you know, um, it, it came out originally and we had pictures in there. Then the pandemic hit, the uh, COVID pandemic, and we were of kind of in lockdown. And uh, Kevin had purchased all these pictures from the archives at CBS. And he said, you have, you know, free reign, just go ahead and use whatever you want. And I think you should update this. So we They're added- all in the book. This is, yeah, we, we added so many more pages to the book and so many more pictures that nobody had ever seen before and stories. I mean, you know, Bill and I just started going down this kind of path of, you know, our, our past of, you know, our experiences on the show. And so this, this book has so much more written about our experiences and what was happening and, and things um, behind the scenes, behind the scenes, uh, yeah. you know, quips and things that the first one, when it came out, did not have. So this is a I very believe. different book with a lot more in it. So oh, what is it, three hundred pages? I was just going to say, uh, isn't it like? I mean, yeah, it's, it's a very thick perfect. book, and it's. Yeah. Uh, I believe there's. Uh, I believe there's over nine hundred photographs. It, yeah, there is over nine hundred. And, wow. and a lot of them are, are personal, also from our personal collections. Because we were at home, Beautiful. Um, we were able to, you know, I have so much stuff I need to go through. And I was using the time of being kind of locked at home to go through some of that stuff. I think Bill was the same. And uh, so that's why there's just so, I mean, the cool things. Yep. That's, that's Bill and me. Wow. Yeah. And the quality looks just fantastic. You, I know you were commenting on that earlier, but even as Bill is like flipping through there, I mean, it just looks like a real quality book. It, it is. is. Really we're happy. Video. We're very proud of it. Yeah. I well, I'm not kidding. I will. I I will definitely have to reach out because I I would like to have a copy of that. That's pretty cool. Um. Well, I I got to tell you, it's uh, obviously I don't want to keep you guys too long here. I, I you guys have just been fantastic. Uh, I got to you know as a fan, I think it's really cool the bond that the two of you have. I mean, it's not that's just not the norm all, always. You know, when I when I talk to people I, that have been on different shows. It's like you have this like for real brother sister vibe going, and it's it's just it's just nice, just really nice to see, you know. It's strange, very strange. <laughs> hey, one last one last thing: the danger Will Robinson thing. Is that true? It only happened one time. Uh, well, you know, it's been used as such a catchphrase. I mean, a synthesis that owns the rights to the old show is a has patented it or something. Uh, it's been used so much in, pr in promotion that it's hard for me to swear that it was only used in the show once, but I do think it, that's that's perhaps true. Once or twice, he, he would say, warning, warning, danger, danger, uh, you know, or Will Robinson, this or what, but he only used those three words, danger, Will Robinson, once or twice, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, listen, I do this with every every guest that I've had on my show. I like to give you you each, in this case, each of you, um, an opportunity to talk uh, just about what you're involved in now, like whether that be charity work. I know that, uh, Angela, you're very involved in photography. Bill, I know you're very involved in music. Um, if you could just, you know, let people know where you're at right now and, you know, maybe where they can get a hold of, you know, the stuff that you, you put out. Um, Angela, would you like to say something? Yeah, um, so right now I am a, an artist and uh, that's what I basically am doing for grandkids to uh, keep me busy. And, um, you know, right now I feel like I'm in the middle of the, there's some stuff coming up and I feel like I'm on the, the, the edge of that. Um, my website, Angela Cartwright is, uh, you know, I've got stuff up there that you can certainly always follow me on Instagram. And I always put everything on Instagram that's coming up or, or that I'm doing. Um, so that's a good place to follow me. 
um, Angela Cartwright Studio is my little cottage shop. You know, I have jewelry and books and uh, just things that are my favorite things. So uh, that's that's what that's all about. And that kind of keeps me busy. And so, obviously they can get the book too. They can <laughs> yeah. get the book there yeah. and lots of other stuff. Just go to Lorenz and, and all right. check it out. And yep. uh, that's basically what I'm up to. Well, fantastic. That's very cool. Bill, how about yourself? Um, well, I'm a producer on Ancient Aliens and have been for the past six seasons. Wow. So uh, that's my current television reality. I am writing currently the autobiography. Uh, a few months ago, Barnes and Barnes, who you might know from Fish Heads and things like that, yes. my, novel, my novelty music group, uh, released a new album called Pancake Dream with a, a, a full 13 uh, videos that, that I edited together that we made uh, to wow. accompany the record. It's kind of like a Twilight Zone-ish project. Um, I have two uh, upcoming albums in the can right now. Still, one's got a couple of tunes to finish and the other's still got to be mixed. But musically, that's happening. I, I'm, on, I'm on my Facebook page a lot. I play a lot of music every Monday for the, the fans and uh, try to give back a little bit. I miss being out on the stage and playing gigs with fellow musicians. But since the uh, pandemic, I've really just been playing at home and I've been making these, uh, some of these records via file sharing. So, you know, a, a drummer will send me his tracks and I'll mix them in with mine. And it, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting way to work, but it's still collaborative. And uh, that's about it. My family as well. And uh, I have two little granddaughters and my son and my daughter are healthy. Thank God and live near me and, Wow. So I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm living a creative life and uh, I've been hunkered down for the last couple of years. I get it. I get it. Well, listen, uh, thanks to, to both of you. That That's cool. I mean, I think that that's just something that people like to know. They like to know where you're at right now and what's going on. So um, if you don't mind, show that book one more time, Bill. And uh, obviously, uh, studio.com. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you got the music. Hey guys, yeah. thank you so much. Seriously, from nice my heart. Nice talking with you, John. Appreciate Thanks, it, John. You got it. Peace, everybody. <laughs> Been a Bye. pleasure. Take care of yourselves. Bye. Bye. Hey, if you haven't done so already, hit the subscribe button in the corner of the video so that you don't miss any of our future YouTube podcasts. Also. Follow us on iTunes and Spotify and leave us a review.